Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture on 3D computer vision. And today we are going to talk about structure from motion and bundle adjustment. Hopefully, by the end of today's lecture, you'll be able to describe the pipeline of large scale 3D reconstruction. It consists of three parts, namely the data association, structure from motion, and then stereo algorithm. In today's lecture, we'll look at data association and structure from motion in more detail, and we'll look at then stereo algorithm in more detail in next week's lecture. You should be able to explain the use of robust two view geometry and the back of words algorithm for data association. And next, we'll look at how to use the two view geometry, the PMP algorithm, as well as the linear triangulation algorithm, which we have learned in the previous lectures to initialize the 3D reconstruction. And finally, we'll look at how to apply iterative methods such as Newton, Gauss-Newton, and the lubenberg marco algorithm for bundle adjustment. Of course, I didn't invent any of today's material, and I took most of the materials from the tutorial on large-scale 3D modeling, which was a tutorial conducted at CVPR 2017. Here's the link to all the slides and the content of this particular lecture. I strongly encourage every one of you to look at these slides and the content after today's lecture to reinforce your idea on uh, large-scale 3D reconstruction. And I also took a lot of uh, the materials on bundle adjustment from Richard Hartley's and Andrew Zizerman's textbook, Multiview Geometry in Computer Vision, in particular, Appendix 6. More information on bundle adjustment can be found in the paper that is written by Bill Trix. Uh, Bundle Adjustment, a Modern Synthesis in 1999. And if you are interested, you should look at uh, Chapter 11 of my East textbook, An Invitation to 3D Computer Vision, to find out uh, more about the uh, general pipeline of 3D reconstruction as well as bundle adjustment. Now, the problem of large-scale 3D reconstruction can be cast as uh, follow. Suppose that we are given a set of uh, images denoted by i1 to in. Uh, let's say if this is the set of images where we have uh, i1, i2, all the way to in over here. The objective of large-scale 3D reconstruction is to first find out the motions of the cameras that have taken these particular images. This simply means that given a world reference frame, uh, which we denote as fw over here, what we want to first figure out would be the camera projection matrices uh, denoted by P1, P2, as well as Pn. And we have seen that we can do this using two techniques, which is uh, the relative post estimation, as well as the absolute post estimation in our earlier lecture. And then once the motion of the cameras, that means that uh, the camera projection matrices of these cameras have been found the next thing that we want to do would be to recover the 3D structures from the image correspondences as well as the camera projection matrices to triangulate for the 3D structure. For example, if I have a, a correspondence over here, I know P1 and P2. We have seen in the earlier lecture that we can do linear triangulation to obtain this particular uh, 3D point over here. And today, we are going to put everything together to see how we can do this uh, for n views. That means that if I have n images, I want to do the motion estimation of the camera as well as the linear triangulation algorithm to get all the 3D points that is seen across every single image in this collection of uh, images. In a case where we are just interested in recovering the 3D points that corresponds to these image correspondences, then this would be known as the uh, structure for motion, which we call SFM. And in fact, the name implies that uh, the steps over here, because we are finding the motion of the cameras first before we find the 3D structure, hence the name uh, structure from motion. And in late next week's lecture, we will also look at the case where we are interested in recovering the 3D point of every single pixel in the collection of all the images. As a result, we will get a dense 3D reconstruction. And that would be uh, called the dense uh, stereo algorithm, which we will look at in more detail in next week's lecture. 
as I mentioned earlier on, there are three uh, key parts of the pipeline for large scale 3D reconstruction. The first would be to do data association because we are given a set of images which are in unordered uh, sequence. That means that uh, I give you I1, I2 all the way to IN over here, but I do not know how are all these images related to each other. So the first step would be to figure out whether they are uh, related to each other geometrically uh, in the sense that we want to suppose that uh, I take any pair of the images from this uh, collection of images over here. Uh, let's say I denote this as IJ, II and IJ over here. I want to find out whether this, uh, these two images are seeing the same 3D scene or not. So the first, the, the obvious thing to do here would be to first extract image correspondences and then compute the relative transformation or you are using the fundamental matrix or the essential matrix to see whether these two uh, images are related. If they are related, this means that the number of image correspondences here after the robust estimation of the fundamental or essential matrix would be more than a certain threshold. And the next thing that we want, once we have established the image correspondences and the data association, the next thing that we want to do would be uh, to do the structure for motion. As I mentioned earlier on, is that given a pair of image over here, we will first compute the pose, which we have done uh, computing the fundamental or the essential matrix. Uh, we can simply decompose the fundamental or the e essential matrix into the camera projection matrix over here. So we can decompose this into a camera projection matrix, which means that we have obtained the motion of the camera with respect to a single uh, world frame. And uh, this can be done using what I have mentioned earlier on here, uh, using the relative uh, pose estimation algorithm. Or once we have some, uh, the, the first two poses, for example, and uh, after this, we can do triangulation to get the 3D points. So in, in the future, subsequent views where we add in more views, we can actually simply find the 2D, 3D uh, correspondences and apply a PMP algorithm to find the pose of this or to find the camera projection matrix of this guy over here. And that would be the absolute pose estimation algorithm. And of course, we'll use the linear triangulation algorithm that we have seen earlier on to do uh, triangulation of the 3D points from the image correspondences and the pose of the images that we have found from the relative and absolute pose estimation algorithm. So once we have completed this procedure, uh, the motion, computing it from the relative or absolute pose estimation algorithm, and then followed by the linear triangulation algorithm to get all the 3D points in N views. The final thing that we want to do would be the bundle adjustment algorithm, where we simply optimize over all the parameters in the camera projection matrices uh, over all the views as well as the 3D points, such that the reprojected 3D points onto the image, the reprojection error of this is minimized. And uh, as a result from this structure for motion, we will be able to get a sparse 3D reconstruction of the scene. And uh, next week, we'll look into more detail that the final step to this large scale 3D reconstruction uh, pipeline would be to uh, do a plane sweeping algorithm or dense stereo. This is actually a dense stereo algorithm, a multi view dense stereo algorithm, where we simply, given the pose of the camera, we simply try to get the depth map or the depth of every single pixel in every image. So as a result, because we are doing this for every single pixel in every single image, so as a result, what we will get would be a dense 3D model of the scene. We'll look at this in more detail in the next lecture. Here's an illustration of the large scale 3D reconstruction pipeline. So as mentioned before, uh, we start off with a collection of unstructured image, which we denote as I1 all the way to IN. So in the beginning here, this is a collection of unstructured image. What it means is that we do not know the relation uh, between any of these images. They are simply uh, treated as independent uh, collection of images uh, in, this, in this unstructured collection of images over here. Then the first step that we need to do would be to do uh, 
it's what we call the data association. And as I mentioned earlier on, is that uh, that we will take a, a, every pair of images in this collection of uh, unstructured images and apply the image correspondences, extract the image, uh, image key points and establish the correspondences from this pair of images. Then we'll do a, a relative post estimation or a robust two view estimation using the RANSAC algorithm that we have seen earlier on. And from here, we will be able to establish how many uh, in layer correspondences are there between the two image. And if this set of image correspondences is more than a certain threshold, then we conclude that there is an overlapping field of view between this pair of images. And as a result, what we will do would be to uh, build what we call the scene graph over here, where uh, if, there, if the number of in layer correspondences from the robust two view geometry exceeds a certain threshold, we will add an edge between the two images. And the nodes of this graph, the scene graph, are simply all the respective images from the collection of unstructured uh, images here that we are given. Once we have uh, established the scene graph, uh, the next thing to do would be to do uh, structure for motion. And of course, the first step that we want to do would be to uh, estimate the camera poses, the camera projection matrix P1, P2, P3 of every single uh, camera view from the, the collection of the images that are related in this uh, scene graph. We do that uh, using the relative post estimation algorithm as well as the perspective endpoint algorithm that we have seen earlier on in the lectures. And, uh, the, uh, and, and then once we get the poses of all the cameras from the scene graph, uh, from the post estimation algorithm, the next thing that we can do would be to do uh, linear triangulation, apply the linear triangulation algorithm on the image correspondences uh, to obtain what we call the sparse 3D model over here. It's sparse because we are extracting key points, sparse sets of key points from the image to do linear triangulation. So here, uh, we are in contrast to the dense modeling, we are not doing it for every single pixel. Hence, the number of uh, 3D points that we will obtain would be a sparse uh, set of uh, 3D points. So in next week's lecture, we'll look at how to recover a dense 3D model. An example is shown here uh, from the structure for motion pipeline. So uh, just very briefly now is that uh, given a set of multiple images where we know how they are related to each other. So denoted by P1, P2, the camera matrices P3 and P4, for example. What we want to do here in this dense modeling would be to do to obtain the 3D depth of every single pixel in every one of these uh, images. So as a result, we will get a dense uh, 3D model uh, from, from here. So an illustration of the structure for motion algorithm is shown in this figure over here. Uh, we suppose that we are given I1, I2, and I3 over here, three images. So the first step that we need to do would be to establish the data association that these, are, these three views are related to each other. And then the next thing would be to recover P1, P2, and P3 by doing uh, the relative and the absolute post estimation algorithm. And finally, we are from the set of sparse image correspondences, we'll do apply the linear triangulation algorithm with the known camera projection matrices to get the sparse set of uh, 3D points as illustrated in this particular figure. And uh, one thing to note is that all these camera poses, the camera projection matrices, as well as the 3D points, they're they are all expressed with respect to a, a consistent world reference frame, which we call FW over here. Here are some examples of the uh, structure for motion. Uh, the first example here is taken from uh, open source uh, pipeline, which is called uh, CoMap. Uh, this is an open source structure for motion uh, pipeline where you can actually input all the images and it will output something like this, where each red point over here denotes a camera pose and the colored point cloud over here denotes the structure that is being reconstructed from the structure for motion pipeline. 
And here's an example uh, of uh, the city hall in San Francisco, uh, which is uh, in, done in an earlier work that I was uh, involved in. It was published in CVPR 2016. And here's an uh, earlier work by uh, uh, Samuel Aragao and Noah Snavely, where they reconstruct uh, the, the Colosseum of Italy. You can see that every single camera image uh, and the pose is respective pose with respect to a, a 3D world frame, a fixed world frame, which called FW over here. Uh, it's it's illustrated in this figure over here. And uh, the, th the reconstructed 3D point is simply the 3D model that we want uh, of the Colosseum. Now, the first step in large-scale 3D reconstruction, as we have mentioned earlier on, would be to do uh, data association. So uh, starting from a collection of unstructured images as illustrated in this uh, figure over here, the final thing that we want to get would be the scene graph, where the node represents every single image in the collection of images that we are given. And uh, all the edges over here simply uh, rep represents that the pair of image that is uh, being connected by this particular edge over here uh, has overlapping field of view. And the first step over here would be to establish what we call the uh, connected components. So a connected component simply means that uh, all, all of this, the whole set of uh, images that's in, the, in, in a connected component uh, has overlapping field of view. And we'll make use of uh, what we have learned earlier on in the earlier lectures, the two view geometry to establish the connected component. So uh, we'll choose any pair of images the, from the collection of unstructured uh, images. And we'll first extract key points, uh, the sift or op key point correspondences. And, and, and then we'll establish the correspondences between this uh, set of uh, key points and followed by computing the fundamental matrix or the essential matrix in the RANSAC algorithm. And then we'll check the number of inliers to establish whether this should be a link or not. So here uh, is the slide where I illustrate the three steps of data association. As I mentioned earlier on, suppose that we are given a, a pair of images that is shown in this uh, diagram over here, uh, we'll first extract key points, image key points, uh, which I will, unfortunately, I will not go too much into the detail of uh, image key points extraction, uh, the algorithms for sift or op. Uh, if you are interested, you should refer into these two uh, papers. Sift feature is a very uh, famous uh, image feature that has been used uh, for uh, in computer vision very extensively. And the first step over here would be to ext uh, extract the image key points as well as the, the descriptor. So every one of these key points over here, the key point represents a single pixel or a single location uh, within the image. And every one of this single this uh, key point over here, it comes with a descriptor, which is usually 128 dimension uh, for SIFT, for example. So this 128 dimension, you can think of it as a signature or a thumbprint for this particular location in the image. And uh, we will use this image descriptor uh, to match across two images. Suppose uh, this and this feature over here, this key point over here, I have two, uh, I'm going to extract the image descriptor, the key point descriptor in for this particular key point in this image, which call, I call I1, and then I have another image over here, I2. I'm going to extract this uh, image descriptor which is also a 128 dimension if I'm using a uh, sift uh, descriptor. So I'm going to match them, a dot product, which will tell me whether they are uh, similar to each other or not. And if they are similar, then I will say that uh, this is going to be a match. Uh, and hence, I will be able to establish these uh, correspondences have illustrated in this particular figure over here. So a line over here simply means that I'm going to uh, say that these two key points over here are, are a match. So I'm going to say that this is a putative uh, image correspondence in, in my pair of uh, images over here. 
And we all know that uh, since image correspondences are obtained purely based on appearance, that means that I do not make use of any geometrical information to uh, establish these image correspondences up to this particular step over here. Hence, uh, we, we, we know that by doing that, uh, by only relying on the visual appearance, we are bound to get outliers matches, which means that some of these matches, for example, in this case over here, they are not correct match. Visually, we can tell that the correct match should be somewhere here, for example. So, but the uh, sieve key points that we extracted and the descriptor that we extracted uh, gives us a wrong match over here. And the so the next thing that we want to do would be to apply our robust two-view uh, geometry estimation in order to uh, do what we call the geometric verification algorithm. So geometric verification algorithm simply means that given a putative set of correspondences, I1 and I2, I have all these correspondences. So some of them might be wrong. Some of the image correspondences might be wrong. And what I want to do here would be to apply the RANSAC starting from this uh, set of image correspondences, which I denote as X i and x i prime. So this set of uh, image correspondences, and uh, I want to run the RANSAC uh, fundamental matrix algorithm or the essential matrix algorithm, depending on whether this is an uncalibrated camera or calibrated camera. So uh, the calibrated camera means that I know K, the intrinsics, and uncalibrated camera means that I do not know the intrinsics uh, of the camera. So I can choose either one of these two view geometry algorithm to apply uh, ransack on this set of correspondences. And at the end, I will get the, the set of inliers based on the, either the fundamental matrix or the essential matrix uh, model. And from here, we can see that uh, yeah, after the applying the algorithm, we'll be able to distinguish which are the inliers, which we uh, illustrate colored here as the green lines, and the outlier sets would be colored as the red lines over here. So once we get this, we will be able to uh, count the total number of inliers. And if this total number of inliers exceeds a certain threshold, what this means is that there are a lot of uh, correct image correspondences to support the two view geometry, to support the fundamental matrix or the essential matrix that uh, we compute. So in other words, what we are trying to do here is that we are in addition to the uh, establishment of the uh, putative correspondences purely based on appearance, we are applying geometry because this is two view uh, geometry that we are applying. So now we are applying geometry to further determine whether this set of image correspondences are inlier or outliers. And if there are more than a certain number of inlier counts, then we say that uh, this fundamental matrix or the essential matrix is correct. And uh, what it also implies is that these two views are actually seeing uh, the same common scene where all these points are being projected onto the two views as image correspondences. And once this is determined, so if the number of inliers, total number of inliers exceeds a certain threshold, we'll add an edge to link the two image in the scene graph. So one of the problem of doing this is that it's uh, exhaustively searching through the pairs of images in the set of n images over here, where we are given i1 or the way to in. So every, by doing this, we have to exhaustively take every pair of image from these n combinations, from all this given set of n images uh, to establish the geometric verification. And it could become intractable and when n here is uh, too large. So the complexity of just querying one image, uh, suppose that we have a, a collection of n images over here and we want to uh, pick one image and query it to all the other images in, in the unstructured uh, set of uh, images that we are given, the complexity will be in the order of 
n k square where n here is the number of images in my collection k here is the number of key points because for every pair of uh, images i have to have to check through k number of uh, key point correspondences in this particular pair so altogether for one query image for if i were to take one image out here which i call i query i would have to query this n times and for each pair of this query i have to go through the correspondences in the order of k square Hence, each one of this uh, query image would incur a complexity of n k square. And now, uh, let's look at an example on how computationally expensive would this be. Suppose that we have 1000 C feature per image. And uh, this means that given one image, we are going to extract 1000 uh, C features. C feature. We are going to uh, extract 1000 C features over here. And hence, k uh, would be equals to 1000 and suppose that we have a hundred million images in our database that we want to query against so n over here would be equals to 100,000 uh, images now given this particular query image what we want to do here is that and uh, we have 100 million of this we have 100 million of this uh, database images we want to query every single pair over here and this would si simply means that we have to do a comparison of 100,000 million uh, features and if we further assume that uh, it takes 0 0.1 millisecond to compare each pair of feature in the query image and the database image then this means that one query image would take about 317 years to compute. And uh, imagine that if we were to exhaustively compare all the pairs of images in the database, then this would even take a much uh, exponentially longer time. So the solution here would be to use what we call the back of words image uh, retriever approach. And the goal here is that instead of using a case where uh, a brute force way of uh, comparing every single image correspondence in the pair of images that we are given, the query image as well as one of the images from the database, uh, this will incur k square complexity. We are going to build uh, an efficient tree based search algorithm for the match, uh, matching of the query image features with the image features in the whole database. Now, I will briefly go through the algorithm to do this. The first step here is that we are given a set of uh, training images, which we call the training data. So note that this set of training images can be any collection of images that you have. It could be simply a set of uh, images that you randomly crawl from the web. So suppose that uh, we have this uh, set of images over here. And uh, what the first step of this uh, image retriever algorithm would be to extract key points and the, dis uh, and the respective uh, descriptors of these key points and uh, store them uh, in the computer. So now suppose that uh, for illustration purpose, uh, I'm going to illustrate these key points as a two-dimensional uh, key points. So suppose that we are able to visualize or we are able to plot the distribution of this uh, key point descriptors that is extracted from the each one of this single image in our training data set. Uh, it would be, look something like this. Uh, of course, in reality, in the case of a SIF, we would have 128 dimensions. Uh, so you can think of it this way that uh, now I'm going to visualize this 128 dimension. If I can plot uh, 128 dimension x1, x2, x3, and all the way to x128. So this each shift feature will lie somewhere in this 128 dimensional space. But for the sake of simplicity, to illustrate this, I'm going to just use a two dimensional feature where it's going to be shown as X1 and X2. So I'm going to plot all these features as uh, shown in this diagram over here. For every uh, training image, I'm going to extract the key points. 
the descriptor of the that associates with uh, every single key point from this set of training image. And suppose that I'm going to uh, consolidate everything together, all the key points, I'm going to consolidate them all together. And this is the final set of uh, key point descriptors that I have plotted out in the two dimensional space x1 and x2. And the next thing that I will do is that I will perform uh, hierarchical clustering. In particular, I will do a hierarchical k-mean uh, algorithm over here. I wouldn't uh, go into the detail of the k-mean algorithm because uh, this uh, algorithm, you should have learned it from your undergraduate classes. So, uh, but uh, very simply over here is that uh, what I want to do here is that uh, given the set of all the descriptors that I've uh, seen that I've talked about earlier on here in the two dimensional space, uh, what I want to do would be to hierarchically cluster them into K different clusters per level. So we start off from a root node, for example, the root node here would simply be the centroid of this descriptor. So here, this, this guy over here uh, is the root node. Uh, one of the choice would be simply to compute the centroid of all the descriptor and assign it as the uh, root node. Then in the second level, suppose that uh, in this particular hierarchical k-mean, uh, this k-mean tree over here, I'm going to uh, define it as a three, uh, three level tree. And for each level, I'm going to perform a k-mean and that k would be equals to three for each level. For each uh, for each level and what this means is that starting from the root node which i can choose it as my centroid of all the features the next level i will uh, based on this uh, root node over here i would uh, look at all the features and uh, perform a k-mean that means that i want to uh, split them into three sets uh, assign each assigned by a centroid over here and uh, in this particular example over here we can see that the second level is actually uh, denoted by these three nodes over here so three nodes over here they are the mean of the three clusters that uh, each second level then the final level that we have would be the leaf nodes over here in this particular example over here so uh, in the in this particular example over here for each one of the cluster that i have in the second level that is shown here in, illustrated in this uh, figure over here for each one of the cluster that is represented by these centroids at the second level i want to further uh, split them into three clusters using the k-mean algorithm so in this case here i will have one two and three clusters that is each represented by a centroid node in the leaf level of this uh, three level tree over here. So it, similarly here, I would split them into three clusters and this guy over here, it will be also split into three cluster. And as a result, what I would get here would be a k-mean three over here. It's actually, it's a three level, uh, three cluster or uh, three mean tree and now what it means here is that each one of this uh, descriptor would be referenced to the closest leaf nodes that uh, it's a representation of the each one of this descriptor in our original collection over here and the next thing that we want to do is that once we have uh, built the k-mean tree from the training data we can discard the training data uh, that's not uh, no longer useful and what we will make use of uh, for the image retriever algorithm would be simply the uh, this k-mean tree that we have learned it's a uh, you can think of it this way that this k-mean tree here would be a representation of all the uh, possible image descriptors that we can extract from the training data now the next thing that we need to do would be to uh, build what we call the inverted file uh, index. Uh, this would be the set of images from the database that we wish to uh, query upon. And so for every one of this uh, image, we'll first 
extract the image key points, the image features. So these are the images in my uh, database. I'll first apply the sift or uh, op feature algorithm to extract all the key points from every single one of these images uh, in the database as well as the to get the descriptor and then for each one of this image uh, key point i will make use of the descriptor and search for the closest leaf nodes in this tree over here so what it means here is that starting off from a key point descriptor which is a 128 dimension if i'm using sift for example i'm going to start to query because each one of these nodes over here, it represents a centroid location in the actual 128 dimensional space. So every time when I started querying, so uh, I will check for the node that is closest to this uh, query uh, descriptor. So for example here, the first step over here, the first branch, I'll check whether this node is closest to this, this or this. If it is closest to this, then I will forget about the subtrees from these two, the, all the descendants from these two branches over here. And I will further query uh, whether this particular node over here, it's closer to this, this or this. And if this is this turns out to be this particular node over here, uh, it turns out to be closest to the query feature as shown here, then I will ignore this too and say that uh, this particular feature, it has a closest match to this particular uh, leaf node over here. So once we have gotten the closest leaf node for each one of the image feature that is extracted from the database, we will store the frequency count of the uh, image feature and the image ID on each leaf node as a global descriptor. So what it means here is that uh, once I have this query image, because uh, this query's descriptor, it comes from one of the images in the database. Say for example, I have my database uh, image number one, for example. So this has an ID of one. Once this uh, feature, it's uh, when I query with this uh, k-min tree over here, and suppose that this leaf node is found to be closest to this, what I will store at the end would be the image ID. So this would be the image ID number one in this particular uh, leaf node over here, as well as I would have to also store the number of times that uh, this image ID one is coming to this particular leaf node over here. Suppose that there's another key point that is extracted from the database image number one. After querying, it also comes to the same leaf node as the first key point over here. Then I, I would have uh, stored the image ID over here as number one. The first image in my database will come to this particular leaf node over here. And I will also uh, store another number over here, which is the count that belongs to this. So the count would be equals to two over here because two of the image key points from image ID number one are closest to this particular centroid uh, over here in the leaf nodes, in the k-min tree. Here's an example to illustrate the building of the database. Uh, suppose that this is image number one in my database. I'm going to first extract all the key points and the descriptor. And then I'm going to uh, pass this, every one of this single key point descriptor into the k-min tree that I built earlier on from my training data. And suppose that uh, I have this particular image key point uh, that found the closest leaf node to be this. I will store the image ID over here, as well as the count of how many times the image key points from image number one in the database ended up in this particular uh, leaf node over here. And in this case over here, suppose that uh, it's going to come to this, uh, this node, this node, and this node over here and this node over here. So in, in this case, the count would be equals to one and here's ID one and count would also be equals to one. And But we can see that in this example, two of the image key points come to the same node over here. This could happen because 
we can see that every single of this uh, leaf node, it actually represents a space, a cluster of space in the 128 dimensional space. So it could happen that uh, some of the key points that is extracted from the images could lie somewhere inside here. So if they lie somewhere inside this cluster over here, then we say it all belongs to this particular centroid, which is the case illustrated here. So we have two key points that is extracted from the uh, from this particular uh, image over here. And most probably the, these two key points come from the eye over here because they look visually similar over here. So they're going to end up in the same leaf node in the k-min tree. And here, what we are going to do here in this particular node is that we're going to store an ID of one image of ID of one and a count of equals to two over here. Then in this case here is image one and a count of uh, one in this case over here. So we'll do this for every single image in our database. And we can see that what we'll build out here would be a file, an in inverted file that contains for every single leaf node, it contains a list of IDs of the images in the database that has features that corresponds to this particular uh, leaf node over here. As well as for each single image, we'll also count the, the frequency of the image uh, key points that corresponds to this particular uh, leaf node over here. And once this is built, the final step is that uh, given a query image, we'll first extract the key points from this query image over here. And then for each one of these query image, we'll query the visually most similar correspondence using the k-min tree that, uh, and the inverted index file that we have uh, built earlier on. So uh, for uh, the, the exact steps to do this would be uh, for every single image key point that we have extracted from the query image, we're going to query it through the, uh, the tree and find the closest leaf nodes for each one of these particular uh, image uh, key points that we have extracted from the query image. Then the, we'll keep a counter and we'll increase the counter because just now in this uh, particular step over here, we know that for every leaf nodes, it's associated with a list of images as well as a count of how many times this particular image contains a, a image uh, key point that is uh, visually similar to this particular leaf node over here. So we'll do the same thing. Uh, we, we'll make use of this uh, this file, which is the inverted index file, uh, to increase the counter for each one of these uh, image key point in the query image. Once it reaches the leaf node in our k-min tree, we'll retrieve the whole list of database image IDs uh, that is stored in that particular leaf node and increase the counter for those images contains the image correspondence uh, closest to that leaf node. So for example, let's say for this particular uh, key point over here, once it reaches a leaf node, the closest leaf nodes and uh, this leaf nodes over here, and this particular leaf node, suppose that it contains image number one, image number three, for example, this means that uh, this particular key point is visually similar to uh, suppose that this is image number one, number two, number three, and number four. So suppose that it reaches a, a leaf node over here, contains a list that says that uh, number one and number three are in the list that corresponds to this particular node over here. Then uh, I will increase a counter for one and three respectively uh, for this particular feature. Finally, what we will see is that uh, for once we have done the query for every single key point, in the query uh, image over the k-min tree database that we have built up earlier on. Then we will be able to conclude that the image ID in the database that has the highest counter will be the visually most similar image to this particular query image over here. The reason is because uh, in that case, what it simply means is that uh, it has the highest uh, count where for every one of this to be in the same leaf node as the respective image in the database. So here's an example. Suppose that uh, we are given this query image over here. We will extract the key points from this uh, 
from this query image over here. And we'll make use of the existing database uh, K-min tree that we have built from the database as well as the uh, affiliated uh, infer inverted index file that is illustrated over here in this particular uh, figure. For every single key point that we extract from the query image, we'll put it through the K-min tree. So suppose that the first key point finds that this particular leaf node over here is the closest to this particular key point over here. Then we will look at the associated ID in the uh, database that is found in the inverted index file over here. Suppose I'm calling this number one, image number one, image number two, image number three, and image number four, for example. So the first query uh, key point from the query image over here, uh, it is the closest to this particular leaf node. We will see that this particular leaf node contains image number two and image number four from the database. Hence, we'll increase the count by one over here. And then the second uh, key point over here, we'll do the same thing, put it through the k-min tree, the hierarchical k-min tree. Suppose that it comes to this particular leaf. What we'll do here is that check the image IDs that is associated with this particular leaf node over here. And in this case, Number one would uh, correspond to this particular leaf node, so we'll increase this by a count of one. And image number two will increase this by a count of one as well. And then the third uh, key point that we see over here, suppose that it comes to this particular leaf node, we'll do the same thing. And we'll see that uh, image number two receive a count of one, and image number three would receive a count of one. When you build the inverted index file, in addition to storing the image ID in each leaf node, we are also storing the frequency, the count of the image feature. For example, this guy here, the eyes, it's uh, seen twice here, for example. So in the case of this uh, guy over here, if I found a, a key point that is closest to this particular leaf node, I would normalize it by the count. So the count here is equals to two, for example. So what I would do here is that I will normalize the, the count because this is a commonly seen feature in this particular image. I don't want it to be double counted or to be counted twice. In some implementation of the image retriever uh, algorithm, people will simply divide by the number of count or the, the frequency that I've seen this image uh, feature in the database uh, image to avoid uh, confusing because this means that this particular feature is seen too many times and is not discriminative enough in this particular image. So instead of adding a counter by one, I will, uh, in this case, if the count is two, I'll simply uh, add the counter by one over two. I'll normalize it by two because I've seen this feature two times in the training, uh, in the database image. Now, we'll see an example on how this helps in mitigating the computational complexity to establish the scene graph. Suppose that we're querying uh, an image uh, in a database of 100 million images. This is the same case as what we have seen in the example that we have seen earlier on. Uh, we are querying in a database of 100 million images and uh, we will do the same. Suppose that uh, each of the query image has 1000 C feature uh, or, or the query image has 1000 C feature and uh, similarly for every image uh, in the database there's also 1000 uh, CIF key points which we denote as K equals to 1000 over here. Now in this example we further assume that we build a K-min tree with 10 branches and 6 depth which we denote as B and L over here. The number of branches would be 10 and the number of depth level would be 6. Uh, so in total, we would have 1 million uh, visual words. That would be equals to 10 to the power of 6. Yeah, that would be equals to uh, 1 million uh, visual words. And then the number of comparison that we will take would be simply equals to uh, K multiplied by B multiplied by L. And that's uh, equivalent to 60,000 uh, comparison for one single query image in the whole uh, database. The reason is for each query image, I have K number of features and each one of the feature, I'm going to put it through a tree with 
L levels and B branches. So at every level, I will have to compare with B branches. And I'll have to compare with B branches over here. And I'll have to repeat this for L different levels. So it will be B multiplied by L to compute the complexity. And that will be equals to 1000 multiplied by 10 multiplied by 6. And we assume that it takes 0 0.1 millisecond to, for a pair of uh, feature comparison. So this means that for each image query, it will only take 6 seconds to compute. And this is so much uh, faster compared to the 317 years that we need uh, in the earlier example. Now, in summary, the image retriever, it's a, it's a, it has a much reduced uh, complexity compared to the brute force naive way of uh, pairwise uh, matching that we uh, have seen earlier on. So instead of using uh, for one query image, instead of having a complexity of n k square, we now reduce it to n uh, k multiplied by b and l. So uh, as a result, what we'll do here is that uh, we'll first apply the image retrieval algorithm to eliminate the infeasible edges in the scene graph. More specifically, what it means is that given a set of this unordered or uh, unsequenced uh, images, which we denote as i to i n over here, we'll first apply the image retriever algorithm to figure out whether this image are uh, 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 linked to each other whether they are visually similar to each other or not. So hence, uh, as a result, what we will get is that we will get a, a initial candidate uh, set of a uh, scene graph that is computed from the image retriever algorithm. So if these two images uh, from my image retriever algorithm, uh, there's very few matches over here. The, the score over here, they are all very low. Then I can uh, conclude that there is no uh, correspondence over here. And uh, the next step that we need to do is that because image retriever is still based on visual appearance, so the next step that we need to do would be uh, for those links that we add to the scene graph after the image retriever step, we would have to also apply the geometric verification. That means that for each pair of these, I have to use uh, RANSAC to compute the inlier counts. And then if it is more than a certain threshold, then I will let this edge remain in the same graph. Otherwise, I will remove the edge in the same graph.